Hello everyone to Map Time. It's good to have you all here. Um, Map Time is a series of chats we're having with different people involved in the history of maps and the making of maps. So we have librarians, cartographers, uh, scholars of all kinds talking about maps and their history. Uh, we are here every uh, Thursday at noon. It's hosted by me, uh, David Weimer from the Harvard Map Collection, and Garrett Nelson from the Norman B. Leventhal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library. Um, today, we'll be talking with uh, Stace Maples from the uh, Stanford Libraries. And uh, next week, we'll be talking with Majdi al-Shihabi, who's one of the architects of Palestine Open Maps. Um, and that's a platform that tries to improve accessibility to previously forgotten 1940s British Mandate era uh, public maps of Palestine that are now in the public domain. Um, so I have put there uh, kind of a comment that's that should be pinned uh, that will lead you to the slides that Stace will be talking about today. Um, if you have any trouble seeing it, it's uh, bit.ly slash this is Ann, uh, and that'll bring up all the images we'll be talking about and um, some other fun stuff from a pamphlet. So without uh, further preamble, I'll bring uh, Stace on here. scrolling a lot to find Stace, but um, if he, where are you, Stace? Um, Stace, if you put a request in to, to join me, that might be easier. Um, I know you're in here. Maybe because I'm not friends with you. Um, sorry, this might take a little a second. Um, Stace, if you hit that, that there we go. There we go. Still trying to get Stace on here. There we go. All right. Hello. I think the I think the key is for me to keep my hands off of the phone today. <laughs> how right. are you doing? Good. Good. How are you? Good I'm you. well. I'm well. Are you are Are you and all of your folks well there in uh, in Cambridge? Yeah, we're doing okay. Good. Excellent. Excellent to hear. Yeah, we've got beautiful weather so far this morning. So good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Yeah. Great. Um, so can you tell us a little bit, bit about yourself? Uh, All right. We're getting started. Yeah. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Stace Maples. Uh, I'm uh, the geospatial manager at the Stanford Geospatial Center. I've been there for five years now. And, uh, and what I do is I assist uh, scholars, um, faculty, staff, and students in leveraging geospatial data and cartographic content in their research and teaching, um, whatever that means at any given time. So that means everything from, you know, helping folks uh, take paper materials and turn them into digital materials and then turn them into georeference materials and then turn them into vectorized materials. Or, um, you know, in particular right now, I'm spending a lot of time on, in the public health space and, and uh, and over the last couple of years, I've uh, I've increasingly been involved in uh, doing projects uh, that uh, that use machine learning to extract features uh, from satellite imagery, uh, in particular to help uh, public health uh, experts create randomized public health surveys for very very 
uh, hard to find populations like nomadic pastoralists in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, what else? I came to maps. I came to GIS in the 90s through archaeology. Uh, I started doing archaeology in the Southwest. I was at uh, SMU as an undergrad in uh, actually in Lou Benford's program. So I'm a uh, I'm a I'm a Benford uh, disciple. Um, and uh, um, after that, you know, well, actually, I came to GIS and, and, and spatial data in general because my my senior thesis was a complete disaster. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I I did a survey of an 8,000 acre um, uh, ranch, and we found about 250 archaeological sites. And I was trying to do a logistic regression analysis manually, like with you know with like acetate overlays of USDA ma uh, soil maps and things of that sort, and topo maps with sites marked. And it was a total disaster. And I knew. This was in the mid 90s. I knew that there must be a way to do this with computers. I was starting to get into computer graphics and thing in the and the web at that time. And so um, and so I discovered the program up at uh, University of North Texas. Uh, a guy named Bruce Hunter was running a, a GIS program up there. Mm -hmm. um, and I started going up there on the weekends and digitizing my data. And I'd spent about six months trying to create a data set manually. And it took me two weekends to dig digitize everything, all the soils data, all the distance to everything. And then on old computers in 1997, it took me about 10 minutes to run the logistic regression analysis because I had all that data digitized. And that was it, I was sold. I was like, this is the way, not only the way we should be analyzing everything we do in archeology, span it's the way we should be capturing everything we do in archeology. span mm -hmm. And that's, and that's where, where I started working in that space where, where GIS intersects with archeology. span um, I did my master's at University of Texas uh, at Dallas and, um, that's also a great program. Brian Berry, you know, Mr. Central Place Theory, that's his program. Uh, so that was a fantastic program to be in. And from there, uh, I went straight to the Yale Map Collection in 2005 after finishing my, my graduate work. Um, and, and we'll talk more about that in the context of this map that I want to sort of, you know, uh, create our conversation around. Um, it's just one map, but there's all kinds of, you know, there, there's so many reasons I love this map. I mean, the obvious one, once you look at it, you know, the obvious one that jumps out is, oh, Dr. Seuss, but there's so much more to this map than that. And so that's what I want to talk about. Maybe we'll start with how I came to meet this map when you're- Yeah, ready. that sounds good. Yeah, how did you first come across this map by, by Dr. Seuss? I'm going to put it up behind me, but- um, Okay, so I've, got can, it, uh... I've got it printed here too. Uh, before <laughs> before I left Yale and came to Stanford, one of the yeah. one of the last things I did was take all of our our uh, maps that I really love, the digitized ones, and make myself really nice prints of them. And so I have a copy of this map, yeah. and and we have a copy here in the Stanford collection as well, which huh. is really great. Yeah. So and if, for people uh, for people that just tuned in, it's you can see all the slides. They should be talking about it at bit.ly slash this is Anne uh, without an E. Um, and the main map he'll be discussing is, is behind me, but, um, yeah, sorry, keep going. That's, that's great. And, and one thing to note about these slides, I like slides.com because what'll happen if you go to that URL bit.ly slash this is Ann, um, is you will auto advance as I go through the slides, you'll be able to see my cursor. So it'll make it a possible for me to highlight things, uh, for folks while we're doing this. Um, and then after the talk, I'll leave these public so you can go back and look at these maps. And I really suggest you go to the Rumsey, uh, davidrumsey.com to see even more of this kind of content, uh, particularly from the cartographer we'll talk about in a minute. So, mm -hmm. so the way I met this map uh, was in 20, uh, 2005. Um, I had just finished my, my graduate work at UT Dallas, and I, um, I saw a job posting uh, at the Yale Map Collection for a GIS assistant. And I thought, oh, well, that's great, um, because I was just finishing up my graduate work. And so I applied for this job, um, not thinking as a, as a fresh grad student that I would ever be, you know, uh, in the running to, uh, to get this job. And, and so I ended up going up and interviewing with Abe Parrish and, and all the other folks there at the map collection at the time, uh, Fred Musto. And, uh, and next thing I knew, uh, I, was, I was hired. And I was on my way to New Haven, Connecticut. But between the time I interviewed and the time I was hired, 
E. Forbes Smiley was caught <laughs> walking out of the Beinecke Library uh, with probably $100,000 worth of paper tucked in his jacket. And it turned out, you know, this is a story that's been told many, many times. I have an inside view on it. Um, uh, but I will, I, I will summarize it to say this guy had been stealing maps from everybody for years. And, and he got caught. And so the first thing we did when I arrived at the Yale Map Collection was the best thing that could ever happen to me. Now, this smiley is horrible. And what happened was horrible. But for me personally, landing at the Yale Map Collection a month after this guy had been caught meant that we closed down the collection and we looked at every, every sheet of paper in that collection. Uh, about 16 or 17,000 historic maps. And we classified those as the pre-1923 uh, at that time. And then hundreds of thousands of, of, you know, general collection maps and matched all of those to accession records. So I spent three months in the map room at Yale just looking at everything. It was amazing because I, this was my first exposure to historic maps. And what made it really magical was one person, and her name is Margaret Kay. And some folks in the map world will know that name. Margaret Kay has been the, um, the caretaker of the Yale map collection for over 50 years. She's been in that collection as long as it has been a collection. She's been there since Viator built the collection. And in a sane world, she would be the curator of that collection for, you know, since Viator left. But she is one of the most knowledgeable people on earth about historic cartography. She knows these objects intimately because she's been taking care of them for half a century. And so my days at the, my first days at the Yale Map Collection were spent in the reading room with Margaret pulling folders opening them up and seeing what we found. And I'm getting goosebumps now because there are so many things that were just so incredible. But as someone who wasn't familiar with historic cartography and, uh, and, and the history of mapping, this map, when we opened up this folder of world maps and this map popped up, that was, I, I stopped, the whole, everything stopped and I had to just be with this map for a while. And Margaret told me a little bit of the history of the map. You know, there wasn't a whole lot that she knew about it, but she did know that it, that it had a pamphlet that accompanied, accompanied it at one point. Um, and, uh, and of course that it was, you know, that Dr. Seuss was involved in the creation of this map. Um, but this is the map that really made me sort of dive in to an object and its history and figure out what it was about and where it came from and why it existed and who made it. Um, and, and, so, and so this is the map that taught me to kind of uh, learn about historic cartography. Um, I'm going to go ahead and advance a slide. Um, this is it. Uh, this is Anne. She drinks blood. And of course, the obvious thing, the immediate thing that you notice about this map is it's clearly Dr. Seuss is involved in this. It's, uh, you know, you, you see uh, the mosquito, the style of the mosquito. It's, it's clearly Dr. Seuss and the way the text is, is, uh, is arranged. The design of the layout of this information graphic just screams Dr. Seuss. And so for a long time, I assumed that this was just a Dr. Seuss map and that he in fact made the map and, and, uh, and uh, wrote the story. But, um, but there's some interesting gotchas in the story of this map. It is, in fact, not a Dr. Seuss map, and we'll get to that in a moment. But first, I want to talk about the context of this map. And the context of this map, this map came out in the fall of 1943. And, and the context uh, of that is we were at war, right? We were well into World War II. And FDR was having his fireside chats. People were really, I mean, this was a moment where people were really actually interested in maps. As, as interested in maps and, and, and the application of maps to their daily life as we might be right now. And that's because of the war, because suddenly um, people were hearing about places and they didn't understand sort of the, the geographic relationship between these places. In fact, there was a map shortage. The, the day after 
uh, Germany invade, invaded Poland, there was actually a map shortage in the United States. You couldn't get a world map. You couldn't find a map of Europe the day after Germany invaded Poland. And so people were really primed for, uh, for visualizations of geography that spoke to them. And another thing that was changing at the time, World War I had happened already, and we'd been through that, and it introduced the airplane uh, to, to the world, right? It really, I mean, the airplane came before that, but that was really where people said, whoa, what is going on here? And between World War I and World War II, commercial a aviation became a thing. And that really introduced the, uh, the, the thought that anyone could fly, anyone could be above the world and look down in this way. And... And what happened was the old maps that people were using no longer really spoke to the purpose, spoke to what people needed out of a map. And that's because they were made for, what were they made for? They were made for sailing across oceans, all of them. They were all Mercator, right? And Mercator did not speak to the way people were now experiencing global travel and, and movement across the earth because we were compressing geography in a way that wasn't possible before. We didn't anymore have to go around land masses, right? Direction no longer really mattered. It was just simply Euclidean distance that mattered. And we needed maps that expressed that, right? And so there was this um, sort of uh, explosion of... Um, of cartographic products in the in the popular domain in the 40s that really began to uh, express this kind of um, this idea of internationalism uh, and, and a way to look at the world as a whole um, rather than at, uh, from a centric point of view, right? Because Mercator, um, for better or for worse, it, it, you know, it had a purpose, but it was centered on it was Eurocentric. It was centered on Europe. And, uh, and, and that, in this moment, didn't work anymore, right? Because the action was no longer, well, it was. The, the action was centered in Europe, but the action was also centered in the Pacific. And, and, so, and Mercator didn't, uh, didn't handle that really well, right? So, so that's the context that this map appeared in. This map was produced, of course, by the Army. Um, by the Special Services Division of the Army, uh, Army Service Forces. And this was a division that, be, that really, I mean, it, had, it has its roots back in the Revolutionary War, and they would do, uh, you know, and the troops would entertain each other with skits and theatrical, you know, and songs and things like that. Um, moving into, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the Civil War, where they would, you know, they would provi provide commissary carts and coffee carts. And it was really, this, this was a division that was about education, training, and and um, and uh, entertainment really, uh, and and so they handled things like gymnasiums and uh, you know the USO type entertainment, and then things like this, uh, this particular these maps, these news maps in particular, because if you flip this map over, it's not just a Dr. Seuss map. There's information on the back about the war, and so in the context of World War II. Um, this, uh, this group called Special uh, Service Division uh, was spun up, and they began to, to work on these kinds of graphics. And Dr. Seuss, obviously, was a part of this. He, he was in the Army. He was an officer. Um, and, uh, and, and so in, in digging into this and in digging into the role, what I found was that... Um, it wasn't just Dr. Seuss who worked on this map, in fact. And you can find that in the cataloging, but I'll move on to this next. Uh, let's see. Let's take a look. I'm, so I'm looking now at, at probably the third or fourth slide, and it's just the isolated, um, uh, this is Anne, she drinks blood. So one of the first things that, that kind of jumped out at me about this, uh, uh, the, this map when I started reading it was that the text is not in that, that anapestic tetrameter that, Dr. Seuss is famous for, right? And you're like, okay, it looks like Dr. Seuss, but it doesn't sound like Dr. Seuss. So what's going on there? And I did a little more digging, and it turns out that the text, the story uh, um, on the map, and in the pamphlet that accompany, accompanies the map, was actually written by Munro Leaf, who was a much more famous author at the time. By this time, when this was produced, Dr. Seuss had just published Mulberry Street. 
he wasn't yet the Dr. Seuss that we know. I mean, I'm, you know, I grew up with Dr. Seuss. I still have some of my Dr. Seuss books. Um, he was not that Dr. Seuss yet, but Monroe Leaf was the author of Ferdinand, right? And so Monroe Leaf was actually really famous at, the, at that time. So Monroe Leaf wrote the story and Dr. Seuss was really just the graphic designer and illustrator on Monroe Leaf's map, which is really interesting. Um, so I, I found uh, something about the creation of this. There's a, um, see, I've got a little quote here, if I can just find it. There's this uh, magazine from 1943. It's called Hygieia Magazine. It was a popular uh, magazine about medicine and public health. Um, and there's a little blurb in there in November 1943 about Monroe Leaf and this map. And, uh, and, and one, of the, one of the things they say about this map is, uh, is that, you know, there, there's four paragraphs about Monroe Leaf's involvement in this map, including that he was uh, uh, a major in the technical information division in the Army Service Forces, and he was creating, you know, lots of graphics and stories and text like this, um, that they were printing a half million copies of the pamphlet that went with this to be passed out to servicemen who are going to be uh, in the tropics. That's what this map is actually about. It's a tool for a, uh, for a serviceman to walk into a place and look at and see where he's being deployed, where he's going to be, and see if he needs to grab a pamphlet. And we'll get to the pamphlet in a little while. Um, but in this article, there's just one little blurb about uh, Theodore Geisel, who is a captain, uh, also being involved. Um, Geisel is a well-known illustrator and cartoonist, so he wasn't even Dr. Seuss, uh, really, by, uh, at that time. And then there's one other uh, really interesting little tidbit, and this comes from a collection at Dartmouth, the Rahner Collection, and they have a collection of letters uh, between uh, Theodore Geisel and, and folks at, uh, and scholars there at, at Dartmouth. And in a letter uh, to Harold Rugg in 1943, Geisel wrote that, um, as an old flit salesman, and I think flit was a, um, I think flit was a, a, a like a bug spray, some sort of a, a, a bug killing uh, um, chemical. Um, as an old flit salesman, salesman, I find that I am of occasional use in doing semi-educational propaganda against the mosquito. Um, he did the illustrations between sessions on the rifle range and sessions in the Army Motion Picture Studio. So remember. Seuss was doing army movies. He was doing films and educational films uh, with his characters at the time. So he was actually doing animations at the time. And so this was just a little side thing he did. Um, he kind of threw this out there. Um, told, and he continues, this is told as a mock venereal disease cautionary tale. The story portrays the exploits of the malaria spreading Anne, a loose mosquito who really gets around. Now we're, you know, a little horrified by the fact that they're using that kind of context to teach people about malaria, but this is the 40s, right? And so this is the context in which this was created. Now, please interrupt me if you have questions. I can talk until my, your ears bleed about this stuff. So, you know, I think what you're saying is really interesting about uh, how, you know, in, in comparison to something like Richard Eddie Harrison, Eddie's Harrison's maps that are centered on the Arctic usually and showing those different, um, and even the news map that's behind me now, that yeah. you know, this is a common um, style that he developed that's showing the curvature of the globe to show these different contiguities. Um, the, it's as if, it's as if I prompted you. <laughs> but I think what's interesting so, then about the, uh, the, this is Anne map is that it's, it's not, doing those things like it's oh but it is but, but it, it is <laughs> but it's it it's is emphasizing the uh oh it's 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 using a familiar shape but then uh he's tricking you <laughs> try, and i think it's trying to communicate that uh that uh the scent the kind of trying to persuade you about the dangers of malaria by giving you a kind of familiar form but twisting a little bit but yeah. you know go on so so i'm so glad you brought up richard eddie's Harrison, because that's, of course, where I'm going with this, right? Um, he made this map. This is one of his maps, too. And uh, so let's talk about him for a second. Really interesting guy. He, he grew up in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, he was the son of a Yale professor, the, the chair of the zoology department. So he grew up in this sort of, 
milieu of of uh, of intellectualism then in the in the in the twenties and thirties. Um, he ended up uh, going to Yale Art School and getting a, a degree in architecture. Unfortunately, he graduated um, right as the depression was hitting, so it was really hard to find a job at the time. Um, so he kind of bounced around New York. He did some design work. He designed uh, packaging and uh, household objects and things of that sort. And then in in the 40s, uh, maybe the late 30s, a buddy of his who was working at Time Magazine asked him to fill in and do some work um, for Fortune. And and uh, as a graphic designer, he uh, he came at this uh, for the cartographer for Fortune, actually. And he came at this from a, a completely different perspective. And so he was interested in in uh, the uh, telling a story with graphic design. He was really he really understood design in a way that I think cartographers didn't classically, weren't classically taught. Um, I think cartography at that moment was still very, very scientific and not, not really geared towards the public yet. Um, but he really kind of changed that. And, and so one of the things that he really um, just could not stand was the Mercator projection. Um, maybe may, maybe to say that he hates hated it was uh, was is a bit strong, but um, but he really he had this idea that it didn't meet the the needs of the moment, right? Like I was talking about earlier, where you know we had shifted from this uh, this world where we used boats to get across the earth uh, to this world where we were using airplanes to get across the earth, and and things were really compressed now, and and he recognized that that was going on, and so. He um he changed map. He took that Mercator uh, um, uh, projection, in particular in this map, um, and played with it. So this map, I contend, is actually on the Mercator project. It, it, it is Mercator. Um, he plays a little bit with Greenland up here and this extra vision. So you'll notice there's two North Americas in this map, right? And, and he's done that on purpose. Um, for one, he's played on the left side up there with the size of Greenland, and he's, he's accommodated that sort of size problem uh, in, in Mercator, right? But he's also done something really interesting with how he has centered this map. So the Mercator projection centers on Europe, right? And what does that do to East Asia? It puts it safely on the other side of Africa and Europe. And look what he did. He changed it. He actually gave us, he put North America on both sides of the map. He put it on the map twice so that you could see the proximity. So that you could see here where I'm pointing with my pointer in the, in the slide. You could see the proximity of the Pacific theater to North America. So you could see that immediate peril. Right. This was a way for him to indicate the peril of what was happening at the time, I think, by centering it in this way so that you could see the entire theater of war and how, in fact, the U.S. on both coasts was in peril. So that's one thing you mentioned his obsession with those sort of global uh, um, sort of polar projections and and those sort of spherical views, those those almost planimetric but really weird proportion plan uh, views that he does. In fact, on the news map, on the back of this map, he's done that here. So he's taken those that 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 curvature of the Earth, and he's just given you that hint so you feel like you're looking at one of his curved maps and I love that. I think I think that's exactly what he did here. Was he he indicated that curvature on the sides there explicitly to try and create that that effect that he was already conveying in other maps. But he had to show the whole earth. He had to show the whole world because the purpose of this map was for a serviceman to go, oh yeah, I'm going here. Clearly I need a bed net, a pamphlet, and a and a bottle of anti-malarial. So that's about this map. Um, I, you know, another one of those things that I love about this map. You come at this map and you think it's one thing, but it really is something entirely different from what you what initially made you love the map, right? 
So this is, uh, and, and by the way, the, in these slides, the embeds in, uh, in all of these slides are being driven by davidrumsey.com. So you can go to davidrumsey.com and in, in fact, you can click on go to source in this slide and it'll bounce you out to David's site. Um, and the technology that's serving these high resolution images that are actually zoomable, you can't see me zoom in it. Um, but if you're looking at the slide, note that you'll actually be, you should be able to zoom into this slide. Um, this is all driven by a technology called triple IF. So if you're a, if you're an images person in galleries, libraries, um, archives, museums, check out triple IF.io. It is the way we are enabling people to use our collections as data, um, in machine learning projects. And it's the way I enabled all of the things that you're seeing in these slides. So really cool stuff. Triple IF.io. Um, so note too that, uh, to give a plug to University of North Texas, uh, again, they have, they digitized, I think, if not all of the news maps, a couple hundred of them, uh, and they're available. I put a link in the in the Instagram earlier today. Uh, oh, so if you want to see, yeah. if you want to see new, more news maps, uh, that's a good place to go. Oh yeah, the the Perry Castaneda collection is one of the treasures of the earth. Yeah, I love I love that collection. All right, so I'm looking at the news map on the back of this now. And, and so remember these, you know, they dual purposed all of these things. Uh, these maps and these posters that came out in this series were, were sent to troops, right? And, um, and they were sent to troops to inform them in, in, in graphic ways that, that were understandable with images um, to inform them about the progress of the war. Where is the front? What's the air offensive? What's going on in, in all of the theaters on all of the fronts? And, and you can see that Harrison here is using his classic, uh, you know, globe view, his his view of the Earth from space before we even got to space. And I love that. And what you're not really recognizing, what's hard to see in this map at first is what's the perspective? He's looking down and he's making Europe and North Africa, you know, completely unfamiliar. Well, where's he looking from? And this is interesting. He's actually looking from North America across a great circle, the way you would fly to Europe. It's the shortest distance to Europe to look the direction that he's looking in. That's the convention he's using here. It's really interesting. He's also compressing geography and he drove cartographers crazy with this. They hated his maps. Let's just be clear about that. You know, professional cartographers hated these maps as much as professional cartographers probably hated Google Maps and a lot of the, the stuff that was happening early on in digital mapping. Um, but he was serving a purpose. He was communicating with a particular audience and he knew his audience. Um, so one of the other things that I think is really interesting to think about is the, is the period after the war. And who would have seen these maps and who would have been influenced by these sort of popular views of global geography and this sort of this sort of graphic um, representation of internationalism? Um, well, the troops would have seen them. And and that's the greatest generation. They came home and built the, the post-World War country, right? And the many of the folks who who built how we would deal with the world. For instance, Henry Kissinger served in the army for three years and was in the Battle of the Bulge, would have seen these maps, would have seen these views, these internationalist graphic representations of ideas that were probably already in his head. And he would have taken those back to Harvard mm -hmm. and use those in his 400 page senior thesis and everything else that he did after that. Right. I mean, you're looking at that internationalist, that global view of the world that he sort of brought to bear on international politics. And I like to think that, that that's one of the one of the connections between these maps and the world that we're in today, this sort of internationalist and globalist, you know, we're still, we're still sort of hung up on our, our little boundaries, but, um, but this view of an expanding influence and this view of the world as interconnected, um, 
I think his, uh, his earlier maps, for instance, this one world, one war map, hopefully it'll come up for me. Mm -hmm. It looks like it's, let's see if I can get the next one to come up. Looks like my, my Rumsey links misbehaving for that one. All right, so here's the world divided. Um, this is a map uh, at the beginning of the war when, um, when Russia was still sort of aligned with the Axis. And, uh, and what's he doing here? He's playing with, um, with the projection. He's showing you the Earth on this polar projection because he wants you to see that all of this is, is a whole, that the world is a whole, that this is not a separate conflict from North America. And that, in fact, there in Alaska, North America is actually connected to this land. And, you know, it, it might as well just be one big landmass all around. And I love that about this map. And if I can get the previous map to come up now, uh, what you see is this, this later map, One World, One War. Uh, oh, that's such a bummer that it's... I'll try and fix that for you all so you can see it. I'm, ah, seeing, there we, I'm seeing it. Okay, there we go. My, mine wasn't coming in, uh, through, but it is now. So he's done the same thing in this one world, one war map, right? But, it, but now um, the, uh, the Soviet Union, the Russia is, is an ally, right? They're, they're part of the allies. And, and so you can see this sort of the entire world together, one world, right? Look at how much red there is in that map. Um, and the other thing I think is, is actually kind of, kind of charming about this page in general is his discomfort with distorting the Southern Hemisphere is exhibited on the bottom right corner of this page where he shows you actually the map if it were centered on the South Pole as well. He, 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 was, he was unhappy with what he had done, I think, to Australia and wanted to demonstrate that you could do this either way, right? And so he shows you these azimuthal equidistant projections on both poles, uh, which I think is a really interesting thing for him to do. So we're coming up on our, our half hour, but um, so I was going to ask if, if the viewers have any questions. Um, oh, that'd be fun. So you can put them in the little box that has a question mark in it. If you throw a comment in there, I'll be able to see it and we can pull it up for everyone. Um, but I think what, part of what you're saying here, I think is, is really interesting is thinking about how, how particularly during World War II and the 40s and 50s, people are trying to think expansively about what what it, what a kind of worldview means quite literally and then how to represent that and and it's a period of a lot of fluidity in that in that question of well what we with all these new technologies um what happens if we take a step back and think from scratch about what it means to draw a picture of a world and kind of make right. make a map of the world um the so I'm not seeing any questions, but um, but I do think we should we should uh, end it there just so we're we keep to our time. But um, I want to uh, yeah, but mention the floor of the floor of the world ocean because I want yeah to this was so there's a couple yeah. uh, just a couple more things yeah. that I want to mention. Um, the floor of the world is fantastic. I love this map because it just it it blows cartographic you know familiarity uh, out of the water literally right. Um, and, and what I love about this map is the complete lack of any context on land. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's taken, he's, he's using this, this crazy, um, projection, uh, that, that shows the, the oceans of the world as a single mass, right? He loves doing this, right? He wants to, he wants to show you sort of a systemic view, right? He's, he's one of the first people that's really trying to do this hard. Um, and then I love the fact that, you know, this projection tosses the North Pole over uh, to the, the left side of the map. And then this eight views of the world mm -hmm. is wonderful. Um, this is just, I think this map is an excellent map right now, actually. You know, how do you look at the world? This is, you know, people had never, you know, map consumers in the U.S., had never thought of the world in these ways, right? They had never looked at the world in these ways. And I love how he plays with 
um, with the, the sort of cant of the globe for each of these visualizations. I mean, particularly Africa and Asia, those just tickle me. I mean, every time I look at those, I want, I just smile um, because what he's done, I had a, actually, a, when I started in college, I started in graphic design. And one of my drawing teachers told me once that when, when you know something is wrong with a drawing, if you turn it upside down, you'll immediately see the imbalance. And I love that idea of taking things that are that are too familiar and turning them upside down so you can see them in a new way and i think that's exactly what he does in these eight views of the world it's a, <laughs> it's such a cool little uh, convention so i'm not going to go through the rest of these slides but i do yeah. want to point out that i had i did find a way to make a copy of the pamphlet it is in these slides i've cut and pasted it into these slides <laughs> in its entirety yeah. Um, there, there was a poster version of the pamphlet that it's abbreviated, and that's here. I'm showing that on the slides. Um, and, of course, you have to get catalog record in there. So uh, there's a link to the catalog record. But um, if anyone's interested in owning a copy of this pamphlet, you can buy it for about $750. And, and believe me, I've thought so many times mm -hmm. about, about just throwing, going ahead and throwing it down. I should, really. I mean, I love this map so much. I should own, I should own the pamphlet. Um, there's a link to that uh, posting in Hygieia and then a link out to Google Books because this publication is actually online and free. Um, the, some quotes. And then finally, you've got the whole book here. So you can just go through this at your leisure. Um, again, keeping in mind, this is a little racy. It's kind of body. Um, it, it's, it's socially inappropriate for our time. But at this time, it, it had a particular audience, and that audience was receptive to this kind of story, remember. So, um, so I think those kinds of things are important to keep in mind. And then finally, there's a couple more links of more things to explore there. Um, and, and just this little blurb that I really love from, uh, and this is the last slide, um, from uh, Harrison's Atlas. Um, when he's talking about what the problem uh, with, uh, with people's perception of space and geography are, when told that, that the only European capital south of Washington is Athens, or that South America lies entirely east of Jacksonville, Florida, or that Venice is 150 miles farther north than Vladivostok, the layman is apt to express either astonishment or disbelief. Yet these are facts that are correctly and plainly presented on the Mercator map. Of course, if any other kind of map were as exclusively used as Mercator, it too would cause similar blind spots. What is the reason for this sort of blindness? I am convinced that the chief reason is the remarkably persistent convention that North be always at the top of the page. I love that. <laughs> yep, no, that's good. <laughs> Uh, and that's that, that's from the look at the world atlas is that right yeah that that is the um yes a look the at the world atlas. this is yeah. exactly um we have one question uh that i'll bring up here um which is have you seen his beer labels i have not oh, uh, oh well there's a rabbit hole i'll be spending the rest of the day <laughs> in. thank you excellent <laughs> um, all right well thank you slides on on your own the and again that that link is right there uh in the comments there but it's bit.ly uh this is ann um yeah and thank you so much for coming next week we'll have as i said majdal uh, shahabi uh who will be talking about the palestine open maps project um and so stay tuned next week all right good to have you Thanks for having me, David. This has been really, really fun.